So the aim of this podcast is to give you the possibility to practice calculating line integrals of vector fields. And the podcast is made up out of three questions, the final one of which has two parts. In each case, your task is to calculate a line integral of a vector field. F here is given explicitly in each case, and the path C is shown graphically here, 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 and in the final case, also here. So with that, what I suggest you do is you write down the questions with pen and paper, solve them, and come back to them. The answers are on the next slide and the detailed solutions follow, and if you look at the more information on the YouTube page and click on that, you will see links that take you straight to the detailed solutions for each question. So with that, I suggest you now pause the video. Welcome back. So the answers to the questions are now on the next slide. So the line integral for the first question, the answer is 1. In the second question, it vanishes, and you can ask yourself if you can see why. And in the third question, for the same vector field, we get answers that depend upon the path taken, and these are all clarified below. So we can now go on and look first at the answer to this question. So in the first question, the vector field is given here. And the path is a straight line that goes from the origin to the point with coordinates 1, 1. And we can parameterize a straight line in the following way. We say that any point on the path has position vector r, given by the initial position vector, so it will be the origin, plus t, which is a parameter from 0 to 1. And that grows in the direction of the final position, minus the initial position. So at t is naught, we have the initial position here, that cancels, and when t is 1, the initial position cancels, and you are left with the final position. So we start here at the origin, we finish at the point i plus j, so r of t, if we rewrite that, turns out to be t times i plus t times j. The derivative of this position vector is given then by i plus j, differentiate that with respect to t and this with respect to t. And this is the x-coordinate as a function of t, this is the y-coordinate as a function of t going along this line. So in our equation for the force f, the vector field, we can replace x by t and y by t and x squared by t squared. So f turns out to be 2t squared i plus t squared j as we go along this path. We now work out the scalar product of f with r prime, the derivative of the position vector with respect to the parameter t. So we dot in this vector field with this derivative. And so we get 2t squared times 1 plus t squared times 1 again. So we get 3t squared. And of course, this is a scalar product, so we obtain a scalar. And the line integral over the path C is given by the integral from the starting value of the parameter to the final value of the parameter of this scalar product here of f dotted into r prime integrated over the parameter. So here, t goes from 0 to 1. f dot r prime is 3t squared. We've worked that out already, and we just have to integrate that with respect to t. So the integral is 3t cubed over 3. The 3 is cancel. We're left with t cubed. t cubed at 1 is 1, and then we subtract 0 cubed, so the answer is 1. So the answer for this line integral is 1. With that, we can move on to the next question. So in the second question, the vector field is the position vector, and the arc that it takes, the path it takes, is part of a circle going from the point with coordinates r naught, 
so on the x-axis to the point with coordinates 0r on the y-axis. So we can parameterize such an arc of a circle by saying that the position vector is r cos t i plus r sine t j where t goes from 0 to pi over 2. So when t is 0 the coordinate is r i because cos of 0 is 1 plus 0 and when t is pi over 2 this vanishes and we are left with r times the sine of pi over 2 which is 1 times j the unit vector there. So this describes this path. So we differentiate r with respect to our parameterization and we get minus r sine t i plus r cos t j. We can again rewrite f but we don't need to in this case because it's given to us as the position vector so it's r cos t i plus r sine t j. So we just need to take the scalar product of these two and when we work it out what we find is that this term and this term are the same but with opposite signs so the scalar product vanishes. So therefore the line integral of the vector field which can be written as this integral here is going to vanish because the integrand is zero. So in terms of this being a force field moving an object through a path no work whatsoever is done on this path and the question that we should ask ourselves is why and what one can realize is if we draw the path in this way at all stages the force field F is pointing in a radial direction like this so this is the direction of F pointing back from the origin outwards and it's therefore at right angles to the path that is taken so the scalar product could be expected to be zero there is no component of the force field along the path so no work would be done so with that we can move on to the next question so in the final exercise in this podcast we are going in both parts to consider the same vector field F and we're going to have the same initial position and the same final position but we're going to look at two different paths and on this slide we're going to go from here to here using a straight line. So we know how to parameterize a straight line. You take the initial position which in this case has coordinates x is 0, y is 1 and then we go to the final position with coordinates x is 1, y is 0. And t, the parameter, goes from 0 to 1. So this turns out, if we just trace this through, that the position vector as a function of our parameter t looks like this. ti plus 1 minus tj. We can differentiate this with respect to t to get the derivative to be i minus j, differentiate that we get 1, differentiate that we get minus 1, and here we can rewrite f in terms of x and y because we know from this format that x is t and y is 1 minus t. So x here gives us t times y times 1 minus t, y here is 1 minus t. So now we take the scalar product of these two results given here. So we dot this into here. So we have this times 1 plus this times minus 1. So we get that. 1 minus t is a common factor. So we have 1 minus t times t minus 1. And I'm just going to write that because I think it will be easier in a minute as minus t minus 1 all squared. So our line integral over the vector field turns into the integral of this result with respect to the parameter t. And the starting value of t is 0 and the finishing value is 1. We saw that here. And now we see why writing this in this way rather than expanded makes life easier. Integrating this is quite easy. And we have 
bearing in mind the minus sign, which is here, we've just kept it outside, we have one third t minus one cubed. To check we've got that right, we just need to differentiate it in our heads. If we differentiate this with respect to t, we'll bring a three down, which will cancel with the third. We'll reduce the power by one, so we'd have t minus one squared, and then we'd multiply by the derivative of t minus one with respect to t, which is a one. So if we differentiate that, we get t minus one squared, which is what we expected. So now we just need to evaluate this at the upper limit, and when t is 1, this is going to vanish. And then we subtract this evaluated at the lower limit, and that's 1 third minus 1 cubed. So this gives us minus a third minus minus is plus a third, but there's a third minus sign outside, so overall we get minus 1 third, and that is our answer for this particular line integral. Now, many line integrals, not all, are path dependent. And what I want to do now is to show that this is a path dependent line integral by calculating it for a different path. So let's see that on the next slide. So on this slide we have exactly the same vector field f, but we're going to take a different path. So we want to parameterize this arc of the circle such that now we start here and we finish here. So let's say that our position vector is sine of t times i plus cos of t j. When t is naught, this vanishes, so there is no x component, we are on the y-axis, and the y value is 1, so we are here. As t increases, this decreases, we're going down, but the x component is increasing, so we are moving out this way. And when t reaches pi over 2, the y component is 0 and the x component is 1. So this is our parameterization of the path. And if we differentiate it with respect to t, the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. f can now be rewritten in terms of our parameter t. We have here x, y x is sine of t, y is cos of t, so we get sine times cos plus y, and y was cos of t, so we have that. So now we just need to take the scalar product of these two structures, and we get this, sine t cos t times cos t, so sine of t times cos squared t, plus, and now it's minus sine of t times cos of t, so there's a minus sine and it's sine of t cos of t. So this is the scalar product of these two vectors. And now we just need to substitute this in to our scalar product, integrate over the parameters, here it's from 0 to pi over 2, and integrate this with respect to t. We have two integrals to perform, and here we recognize that this is something we can do by inspection, because this is the derivative of cosine, we have here cos cosine squared, so probably this integral is going to be something like cosine cubed, and if we differentiate it, you pull down the 3, so we need a 1 third there because there isn't a number here. You reduce the power by 1 then when you differentiate it to cosine squared, and you then multiply by the derivative of cosine, which is minus sine. Now, here we've got plus sign, so we need to put in another minus sign, so minus minus cancels, and if you differentiate that, this is what you get. Now, back here in the scalar product, I rewrote sine of t times cos of t as a half sine 2t, because I think that makes performing the integral a little bit easier. And if you integrate minus a half sine of 2t, you need plus a quarter cosine of 2t. Again, check, differentiate that. Cosine goes to minus sine. We get the minus sign we want. Good. And then you get sine of 2t. Good and then you multiply by the derivative of 2t, which is a factor of 2, the 2 and the quarter partly cancel, leaving us with a half. So this is correct. So we now have this evaluated at the upper limit, minus itself, this thing again, at the lower limit. When t is pi over 2, we have a cosine of pi over 2, so that's going to vanish. We then add plus a quarter, and it's the cosine of 2 pi over 2, so it's the cosine of pi, 
cosine of pi is minus 1. So that would give us minus a quarter. So all of this at the upper limit gives us minus a quarter. And we then subtract, open brackets, all of this evaluated at the lower limit. At the lower limit, t is naught, and the cosine of naught is 1. 1 cubed is 1, so we have minus a third here, plus a quarter, and the cosine of 2 times naught is still the cosine of naught, which is 1, so it's plus a quarter. So we have minus a quarter, minus, minus a third, plus a quarter. If we expand that out, it's minus a quarter, minus another quarter, minus two quarters is minus a half, plus a third. So it's that. And we put that in a common denominator of sixths, and we have minus three sixths plus two sixths, and that gives us minus one sixth overall. And this is different to the answer when we use the straight line path a moment ago, and so we see that for this type of vector field, the answer is path dependent. And with that, I'm going to stop this podcast.